Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the final session of day two of virtually 2023. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Amani and Heather for their great talks earlier. Um, we're gonna have all the recordings from this week um, available right after the conference ends tomorrow. Uh, my clear text are providing live captions. Um, you can access these by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, alternatively, we have provided a stream text link in the chat for a fully adjustable page of captions. Um, uh, for our final talk of today, we welcome back to virtually Richard Morton, uh, Head of Accessibility at the Central Digital and Data uh, Office of the Cabinet Office, which is part of the UK government. Um, uh, for his talk, uh, Digital Accessibility in Recruitment. Um, please do get involved in the discussion and say hello in the chat. As always, we'd love to know where in the world uh, you are watching from. Um, just make sure your chat settings are switched to everyone and not hosts and panellists, and that way everyone will be able to see your messages. Uh, if you have any questions for Richard, please submit them using the Q&A box. Um, I will try and get through as many as I can uh, at the end. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, over to you, Richard. Thanks very much. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I am, I'm Richard Morton, I'm Head of Accessibility at the Central Digital and Data Office. Uh, I was formerly Head of Accessibility at the GDS, Government Digital Service, and it's good to be back and it's good to be talking on this again. Apologies for me looking off camera, it's just because of the screen set up here, so I will be looking at a big screen in front of me. Um, yeah, so I ran a team trying to improve digital accessibility capability across government digital teams. But today I want to talk about digital accessibility specifically in recruitment, uh, but I just want to make clear what the talk doesn't really cover. It doesn't talk about physical access to buildings. It isn't about adjustments for interviews, uh, for example, time extension, breaks, or having questions in advance. And it doesn't go into what happens after someone starts a role. Um, so it doesn't include things like induction training, that sort of thing. All of those things are really important, obviously, but I'm just going to focus on digital accessibility, which is a big part of things. First, because that's my speciality, and, and secondly, it would take a lot of cover, a lot, a lot longer to cover other aspects of accessibility. So, why do things need to be accessible? Hopefully, it's obvious from the context of this conference and other events going on this week as part of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Uh, that they, yeah, hopefully it's obvious that accessibility is vital, but I'll give you a bit of my perspective on things. Everything we create needs to be accessible to everyone, and that's regardless of whether or not they have impairments in vision, hearing, speech, motor or cognitive skills, or possibly more than one of these areas. So, for example, this means that menus on a phone app or website need to work for someone who might only use a keyboard or might use voice control. Similarly, in, in terms of recruitment of a campaign video, we need captions, uh, which you've got today, obviously, as part of these talks, also known as subtitles for anyone who needs them. Or it might need audio description of things that appear only will appear on the screen for anyone who can't see that, can't perceive that. Also, also each part of a form needs to be labelled in an understandable way, uh, but also so that someone who can't see the form but uses screen reader software to read, read out the page can understand the links between labels and the information they need to enter. Just a couple of statistics, around one in five people are disabled or have a long-term illness, and many people are disabled temporarily, and that could be because of the environment or situation they're in, or just a temporary, temporary thing. For example, some, someone might have broken their arm and they might be temporarily using voice to control their phone or their laptop. Or they might be trying to complete a job application on a train and there's lots of things happening there. Movement of the train, changing light, noise, an unreliable internet connection, distractions, people coming to check your tickets, that sort of thing, making things much more difficult or impossible for some people to, to actually cope with. I said I'd focus on digital accessibility for this talk. So what do I mean by that term? Well, digital accessibility means ensuring that information, digital information, tools and services can be understood and operated by as many people as possible without barriers. That includes obviously web pages, electronic documents, but it also includes things like emails, apps, computer systems generally, and communications. And in the context of recruitment, that isn't just for people who are applying for jobs in your organization. It's also the people who process the applications, the people who run interviews, or the people who manage recruitment campaigns. So in other words, it's for everyone. 
And it's the responsibility of employers to remove as many barriers or obstacles as possible, or of course, even better, to not put barriers in the way in the first place. There are other reasons that things need to be accessible though, including laws and regulations. In Great Britain, we have the Equality Act 2010, which says we have a legal obligation to provide equal access to people with disabilities. For Northern Ireland, this is covered by the Disability Discrimination Act 1995. They're essentially the same thing, but just different, different regulations and laws. And these apply to almost all organisations, not just the public sector, but they include the private and non-profit or charity sectors as well. In the UK, we also now have the public sector bodies accessibility regulations, which build on those other laws. And these apply to most public sector organisations. They legally have to make their websites, internal systems, documents and mobile apps accessible. And they have to do it to a particular standard or at least to a minimum standard. And of course, that includes things like recruitment websites and recruitment and internal systems. Compliance with regulations is monitored by GDS, the Government Digital Service. And there's also complaints and enforcement process that can be followed for uh, organisations if they don't deal with complaints themselves. So a couple more numbers on statistics or statistics about disability, but particularly relating to disability and work. For working age adults, and that's defined as between the ages of 16 and 64, 82% of non-disabled working age adults are employed and 53% of disabled working age adults are employed. Now that's a large difference in numbers. There's a number of reasons for those, obviously, many, many different reasons, but it does seem likely that part of that gap could be to do with recruitment processes not being as accessible as they could be. Source for these numbers is the Labour Market for Disabled People, March 2023, by the Office for National Statistics. So what needs to be accessible? I've talked in general terms about websites, mobile apps, documents and internal systems, but there are a few things specific to recruitment. So things like recruitment campaigns and adverts, marketing, social media, videos, all the, all the routes you use, digital, uh, to, to do recruitment campaigns. But then also the process of applying, whether that's through a website or an app or through emails. Uh, and for documents, you know, people providing documents uh, or people needing documents, providing things like job descriptions, those sort of things. You also need a process to provide them in alternative formats on request. Of course, preferably, if you can provide alternative formats up front, that's a good thing as well. And then there's the administration systems. So for example, managing career summary documents, also known as CVs or resumes, managing interviews and managing communications like things like offer letters and pre-employment checks, which often come, offer letters often come in the form of a sort of document, a PDF or something like that, and the pre-employment checks. Importantly though, if one part of a process for someone applying for a job isn't accessible, then the whole process fails. And that's the same principle for any kind of transaction or interaction. If I can't understand the job description, or if I can't complete a form properly because the labels aren't accessible, or I can't use the buttons to confirm an interview date, then even if the rest of the process works for me, it means I'm stuck, I can't apply for that job uh, without alternative means. And so you've effectively excluded me from applying for that job. Of course, there are many things that can go wrong. Um, from an accessibility point of view. I'll give you a couple of examples of inaccessible things and hopefully some ways to make them more accessible. Here's part of a made up job advert. It says, you can find out about the application process and practical details like our office locations on the things you need to know page. You can find out more about our commitment to diversity and inclusion and read our equal opportunity statement on our diversity and inclusion page. All very good. Um, this is shown as a mixture of green text and red text. It's a bit random, I know, but it's just to, as an example. The red text on here indicates a link to another web page. So it's important to know that. So can you see what the problem is here? Those shades of red and green are quite close to each other. And many people find them hard or impossible to distinguish, particularly if the text is small or they're trying to read it on a mobile phone, on a moving train, for example, 
or on a day with bright low sun, for example. Um, and red green color vision or color blindness is the most common form of color blindness. So I'm not saying no, I'm not saying this is a realistic example of the colors used for body text. Other combinations of colors can also be difficult and possible too. But it's just an example of how it sometimes isn't thought about. So here's the same text but with a change made the links are now underlined where it says things you need to know and diversity and inclusion now more people can identify the parts of this that are text and the parts that are links to another page or a form there's other ways of identifying links and you know you can you can just use colors from a sort of compliance point of view providing there's enough difference enough contrast between the color of the link and the color of the body text and that's quite difficult to do because there's only a small number of shades of for example black grey and blue that work uh, good at, well enough to do that. Here's the inevitable chat GPT slide. I asked chat GPT, which is an artificial intelligence system, a large language model, um, currently in the news a lot, of course, to write a job advert filled with jargon and to create a pompous job title in engineering. And this is part of what it came up with. So director of futuristic solutions, Attention all synergistic and results driven individuals. We're seeking a proactive and dynamic team player. You possess a proven track record in spearheading cross functional initiatives. Sadly, this isn't that different from any real job adverts. I'm sure you've seen things similar to this. Now, maybe someone out there understands your job advert, what you're trying to get across, but you aren't going to reach all the best people by using complicated language that includes jargon or expressions that are not widely understood or abbreviations that aren't explained. What about someone with a learning difficulty or disability, or someone whose first language isn't English, for example? It, and it, that could include someone who's deaf and their first language might be British Sign Language or another sign language. So use plain language. Don't use expressions or metaphors, jargon or abbreviations, unless they are really well known. So in the UK, I probably wouldn't have, have to explain what BT means, for example, or even what UK means. But I would have to explain what CDDO means, um, as I did at the beginning of this talk, but don't worry, I won't be quizzing you on that. Unfortunately, though, when I asked ChatGPT to write a plain English job advert, it didn't do much better. It used terms like data-driven decisions and key performance indicators, which possibly indicates how much of a cultural problem this is, as ChatGPT is obviously built upon large, large, ex large examples of text upon common use of language. I mentioned earlier about standards that can be used to help improve accessibility. Um, they're only the beginning. They're a set of minimum requirements, if you like, and we can go much further in making things accessible. So when I talk about compliance, there's compliance with regulations, there's compliance with standards. That's always going to be seen as the minimum. Uh, we can always go beyond that. So when it comes to designing and creating accessible websites, apps, documents, and internal systems, there are many resources available to help, and many of them are free. And this includes guidance, training, and communities who share an interest in digital accessibility. And after this, I will share a document that we, we share with everyone um, that gives a load of links to things like blog posts and training resources, not just government ones, but things outside. And another example here, uh, colleagues at Home Office Digital created a series of posters about how to design for different accessibility needs. These have been really popular and they've also been translated to a number of different languages because there's demand for this information across the world globally. I've shown three of them as examples only, designing for users who are deaf or hard of hearing, designing for users of screen readers, and defining designing for users with dyslexia. As I said, there's other posters as well, and they give examples, concrete examples of the sort of things you, sh you should do and you shouldn't do when designing. And these are often a simplif simplified or an easier way of understanding things like the, the standards and the web content accessibility guidelines. At government, we also created a series of seven pretend people or personas, and we, we call these accessibility personas because they're specifically about digital accessibility and accessibility generally to help understand how to make systems accessible. These are more than just a list of requirements and help you to think about various common needs. So this one I'm showing is Ashley, who's a 24 years old arts graduate and an administrative assistant and is severely sight impaired or blind and uses screen reader software to read out the text and structure of web pages and to be able to complete forms, for example. 
So personas is like these can be used to help design, build and test systems, but they aren't a substitute for co-designing, building and testing with disabled people. So here's a question, does it all work on mobile phones? I'm just thinking about the applying for a job side of things now. Admin systems are very, usually quite complex and complex displays and probably not able to work fully on mobile phones, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to make them work. But certainly from the application side of things, it's important to make it work on mobile phones. Around half of internet access is on mobile phones. Figures vary, globally figures are higher, uh, you know, particularly countries that don't have the same the, the same sort of level of uptake in, in, in laptops and desktops. But mobile phone usage can't be ignored these days. Um, for example, more than 60% of visitors to gov.uk are using mobile phones now. Many people don't have laptops or desktop computers, or they may need to apply for jobs and follow up, and follow up on things when they're out and about. So if your application process doesn't work on a mobile phone or it's difficult or just hard to use, then you risk excluding many people and you risk excluding the best candidates potentially. Documents, uh, for example, PDFs can be very difficult to read on mobile phones. So best avoided if possible. Obviously PDFs were designed for print. They're designed to have a fairly fixed layout. There is some flexibility there, but generally they come in a fixed layout. So you'd have to do a lot of pinch zooming and stuff to use them on a mobile phone. And that's generally pretty difficult. They can also be harder to make technically accessible than, than HTML web pages uh, generally. Also, it's good to keep things simple. Um, this has always been a principle of gov.uk and GDS in terms of government services, uh, government information. But in, when it comes to questions, for example, on forms, only ask essential questions. Don't ask things that you don't really need to know or that only your marketing department needs to know, for example. And these days, that's also really important for data protection regulations anyway. You can only ask for information that you, you need that's essential. It's good to design things for mobile users first so that the layout works well for them then it's easier to build on that for, for desktop and laptop use and for bigger screens or different devices like tablets, those sort of things. But design for mobile first really helps. Mobile access obviously can be slow on slow and reliable connections. Even, even today, you know, with 5G, that, that's not that prevalent and people are traveling and stuff like that. So they get limited connections. And so too much information can slow things down or break things. So it's good general practice, not just from an accessibility point of view. What about purchasing, procuring, buying recruitment software and services? Even if an organization publishes job adverts on their own website, they're probably likely to buy software to manage the recruitment process, more likely than building their own, um, unless they're a very large organization. They might also use an agency website or an external organization for social media campaigns rather than their own. So it isn't just a case of thinking how to design and build your own systems. It's what you buy, what you procure, what you uh, farm out to others, third party systems, third party services. For any services or products you buy, you need to make digital accessibility a requirement. Many products these days have what's called a VPAT, and that stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, which gives some indication of the accessibility of a product, but it's still best to check these things independently. Sorry about using that jargon. Unfortunately, the accessibility industry can be a bit inaccessible too, but it is a commonly used term, and it's, it's come out of US um, uh, organizations. So, Things like Zoom, for example, that we're using today has a VPAT, has a voluntary product accessibility template, which details the accessibility. Um, and that's really useful to know. It doesn't give you the full answer and they're not accurate or up to date. So sometimes take things with a pinch of salt, but they can be pretty helpful. But you need to go beyond that and ask, will it work for your users? Uh, now we're talking about all people potentially. So does it work for the people who apply for jobs? at your organization and for those who manage the recruitment and for those who manage the campaigns, interviews, all those aspects. So everyone really. It's good to ask suppliers to ensure it works for people with specific different needs or who use particular types of different assistive technology. You can use those personas, for example. You can say, does this work for 
Ashley, who's one of our personas, um, and they're available to, for anyone to use. That sort of question is probably more likely to elicit um, a straightforward or, or a, a, a correct, complete answer than just saying, is it compliant with the standards or is it compliant with your own content accessibility guidelines? Because it's very easy to stick the box and say yes. It's harder to say yes, this will work for anyone using a screen reader um, on Chrome, for example, or it's it, this will work with voice recognition. Uh, that's harder to justify. And if you've got it in a contract, um, it's best to include those requirements. But there are a number of things you can check yourself. Uh, you know, obviously, if it's a publicly available product that you can look at and demo or use, um, you can try it on a laptop or desktop computer. Can you control everything using just a keyboard, for example, instead of a mouse or a trackpad? Not everyone can use a mouse. And voice control, in fact, generally uses keyboard controls or emulates keyboard controls. So if it doesn't work, if some things don't work with a keyboard, they're not likely to work well with voice control. For example, for a simple example, pressing enter instead of clicking should work for links or buttons. If it doesn't, that's a warning sign that maybe it hasn't been coded correctly or accessibility hasn't been thought about properly or hasn't been tested. Another thing you could do is if you use a browser to zoom into the page to magnify it, is it still understandable? Does the page layer break enough to make it unusable? Um, and then another thing you do, if you click on a form label, for example, an address field, does the flashing cursor vertical line move to the form input? If it does, that indicates the two are linked. And if it doesn't, it can indicate a problem um, that might affect screen reader users because labels need to be linked to form controls. And it's not obvious visually whether they are or not, but that's an easy way of checking those things. So that's three simple things you can do as a sort of sense check. So just to summarize some of the things we've talked about, at least one in five people may find they can't apply for your jobs because of barriers, um, digital accessibility barriers. Um, and guess what? Most people who can't get through the process may well just give up and maybe apply for a job with your competitor or another organization. They aren't very likely to complain and you won't necessarily get feedback from them. And, on, and, you know, honestly, why should they provide that to you anyway, unless you're willing to pay them for that feedback? Everything to do with recruitment needs to be accessible. Digital accessibility is an important part of that, but there's much more to it. So you need to take all these things into account. Think about this. Look at your front facing uh, job adverts, recruitment campaigns, communications, but also look at your systems, your admin systems, and get it to work for people who have disabilities, get it to put work for people who use assistive technologies, um, get it for people to get it to work for people who make adjustments. Maybe they change colors on their screen, on their browser. Uh, maybe they use plugins to change things. Just try lots of different things and make sure it works. And, and obviously be reactive. If someone has a problem with something, make sure you can change it and fix it. And of course, make sure everything works on mobile phones because that's only going to get more. You know, people are more and more going to use mobile phones to do everything. Um, so, yeah, don't assume that recruitment system you buy will be accessible or even that the supplier will understand what you mean by digital accessibility. It, we ought to be at the stage now where suppliers are providing accessible systems and things like that. And some are, you know, uh, there are some good examples, there's good practice out there, but there's also a lot who just don't understand this stuff or don't know the impact or don't know what they need to do to make things accessible. Um, you should work towards including everyone. Um, otherwise, effectively, you're a non-inclusive organization and who wants to be a non-inclusive organization? And not just that, you may be breaking the law uh, around equality or the Disability Discrimination Act. So final thought, um, and this isn't from me directly, but I asked, I asked a question about how the 80-20 rule, which people have heard of, should be, could be made better in the context of accessibility. And this is a Twitter quote from Hillary, Hillary Stevenson, who's at Hillary Online. And she said, care more about the 20% and you'll meet the needs of the 80% then keep going as accessibility will never be 100% done. Um, so that's just a sort of 
little quote, and I think it's really helpful. Um, it's certainly true that accessibility will never be done. You know, people talk about something being fully accessible. There's no such thing in my book. Things can always improve. Things change, you know, browsers change, assistive technology changes, systems change. Uh, it's a constantly moving target, but you can do your best to make it better, make it work for more people. So thanks very much for listening and ready to take questions if there are any. Brilliant, thanks Richard. Um, yeah, what an awesome talk. I think that um, that chat GPT job advert does look frighteningly similar to most job adverts uh, in the digital industry. Um, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, please do submit them now. I can see there are a few coming in. Um, so first question, Richard. Um, uh, what do you do if you can't find an accessible platform for HR management? Um, I'm yet to find a really good one. Um, accessibility consultant here working for an agency. HR department uh, often don't have this level of control. Um, we can't audit third party tools. It's a really difficult thing. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer, to be honest, if you can't find accessible systems. I think you have to... You have to be pragmatic about things these days still and it's often a case of what's the least inaccessible system and unfortunately i was saying that five years ago six years ago and i'm still saying it today so sometimes you have to compromise from the point of view of the regulations there isn't really compromise allowed but i think pragmatically you have to go with the best you can and try and work around it one of the things i always say to people is don't just take it at face value, you know, things like a voluntary product accessibility template. Don't take it at face value, but also sometimes things may be listed as being inaccessible, but if you don't use that aspect of a the system, then you don't need to worry about it. So for example, if a system includes video or audio and you're never, never gonna use that, it's not an issue, you don't have to worry about that. Or if there are things that you can um, customize uh, like colors or fonts, things like that, then that can influence how accessible you can make something. Thank you. Um, so uh, our next question here, um, which has been submitted anonymously, asks, uh, as a neurodivergent professional myself, I find some competency questions baffling. I think that most hiring processes are designed specifically to leave people like me out. What are your thoughts on that part of the recruitment process? I think it can be difficult. I've heard people talking about this um, and there are, you know, there's many different ways to ask interview questions. Um, competency is a big thing in the um, civil service, obviously. Uh, it's it's a really difficult one. It's it's you know it's not in my scope really to have any knowledge about what's best or what's what doesn't work in that area. What I do say to people though is always try and be flexible. When you, if you're interviewing and recruiting, try and be as flexible as you can. Offer people alternatives allow people flexibility and things like, you know, allowing people to take a break, allowing people to have questions up front, allowing people to, um, you know, have a break in the middle of an interview, all those sort of things can help. But I can't, I, you know, I don't know enough about um, the sort of un the un cognitive side of things to understand whether particular questions are good or bad or stuff like that. You know, plain, plain language is always important, but I can't, you know, I can't go into that sort of level of detail really. Thanks, Richard. Um, so Helen asks, uh, do the disability, does it, the Disability Dis Discrimination Act apply to suppliers as well as public service providers? Um, do the suppliers have enough accountability for failing to meet accessibility standards? They don't directly um, because it, it only applies to the public sector. And in terms of publishing websites, for example, it's the organization who publishes who have the responsibility. They can delegate it, but um, if, for example, I wanted to purchase a piece of software from an organization, they have no legal obligation to make that meet the public sector bodies or accessibility regulations. They may have some obligations around the Equality Act, um, but that's, that's not very specific. Um, so it's it's up to me as the person purchasing it or contract contracting it to do 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 due diligence on that and to make sure it's within the contract that they they have to meet the accessibility requirements. Thanks, Richard. Um, so we've got um, a cheeky question from from Matt who asks: uh, Can we use the accessibility personas text 
as the basis for our own educational material around this when presenting to clients slash colleagues? Absolutely. It's not a cheeky question. Everything we produce <laughs> is open government um, licensed. So it, feel free to use any of that stuff. I mean, it's paid by, paid by the taxpayers, so it's good that it's available for anyone to use. Awesome. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we that's just checking the chat for any questions. Um, uh, and asks, is there a checklist of accessibility aspects to consider as a designer when designing an app? There's various checklists around. We've used different ones. Um, we created our own sort of simplified tests for things. And we've got, we cried, started to create some of the model methodology for the monitoring team to do the testing. Um, if you look up WCAG Primer, that's WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Primer, um that's on github and it's available publicly and there's information with there on the sort of testing methodologies used i'm not sure how much it goes into the detail for the mobile side of testing but obviously there's been quite a lot of work done to do that and there are differences in the way that you test mobile websites there are a number of things within the web content accessibility guidelines that don't directly apply um and there are some things where you have to do things in a slightly different way um, but but there is some information on there yeah Thank you. Um, so we've got a question here asking uh, if you could please expand on VPATs. Uh, I work for a local authority organisation um, and we procure a lot of products externally. Um, is it worth having an internal checklist or template to send out to suppliers? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely worth having your own template and, and your own requirements. And particularly in the UK, you know, if you if you're in the public sector, you need to meet the requirements of the web content accessibility guidelines version 2.1 level AA at the moment it will be version 2.2 when that finally gets launched but yes in terms of vpats um i mentioned they're kind of us centric so they're often referring to things like section 508 which is uh, the us sort of standard on accessibility and is more linked into uh, it, it's kind of linked into the web content accessibility guidelines but it can be difficult difficult to map it that's why it's a bit difficult to use these things but they they generally they as i say they're available for any sort of global products so you may need some accessibility expertise to interpret these things in the first place which is unfortunate um so yeah setting your own standards in your own template up front is a good way of doing it if you're procuring things yeah Thank you. Um, so we've got a question here asking uh, if you have any resources to help with auditing and remedi remediating accessibility issues. Yeah, in terms of auditing, as I say, the, the, the WCAG Primer, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Primer, has some advice on that. There's also um, there's guidance on gov.uk around the requirements for public sector bodies, and that talks about how you can do simplified testing yourself. And the resources document that I'll share with you later that you can send out to everyone has a number of things on it, including um, the US Government Digital um, Department 18F, who have their own sort of manual testing checklist, which we've used uh, in the past. So there's lots of things out there. And obviously there's a lot of organizations who, who provide checklists or uh, guidance and advice on these things, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. And yeah, all all of those resources you mentioned, we can um, uh, we can share after the talk. Um, I'm going to provide them. I, th I think you said you were going to share your slides as well. And we're also going to have the recording available um, uh, straight after the conference ends on Thursday. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Um, and thank you for everyone that tuned in. Um, uh, we will be back tomorrow for Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, with sessions from Nikki Swain, Principal Designer here at Nomensa, uh, Google's Accessibility uh, Analyst Team, uh, and a panel discussion on accessibility in the education sector. Um, thanks again, Richard, uh, and, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thank you.